Yeah. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to say that we are very proud to be a part of this uh, research initiative. We appreciate the opportunity to work with uh, such a wonderful team that works with Professor Park in HKUST. And as um, Albert has said, we uh, work as a business school in many ways. And specifically, we do joint executive MBA program, and I will uh, talk about it a little in the end. Well, and uh, obviously, you, you can't imagine such a brilliant view in Russia, so <laughs> it's always a pleasure being here. So um, I would like to start with uh, uh, three observations that we've made through the research projects that we are currently undertaking on Russia and Central Asia in regard to Belt and Road. And then I'll try to illustrate those observations with a couple of slides. So um, first observation is that um, Belt and Road projects are not always uh, obvious in terms of the economic efficiency in this region. Not probably everywhere, but in this region. But um, still they go on. And uh, the idea that we have, the concept that we have around it is that Belt and Road for this region is all about alternatives. And I will try to illustrate that on, on uh, further on. So the, the second observation is that um, China is, because of a lot of reasons, uh, such as low, uh, uh, high risk appetite, low return expectations, and huge uh, financial capacity, China is probably the second to known investor in this region. So if not China, nothing would have happened in this region. So it is, it is uh, Chinese very important player in uh, the development of infrastructure and uh, some industrial initiatives in the region. And I will try to show that on our diagrams that we found, uh, that we've built on the data that we collected. And the third uh, uh, observation, that, which is probably not as uh, relevant to other parts of the world. Uh, but Belt and Road in our region is definitely an Islamic economy initiative. It goes through the, Isla the territories of the uh, Islamic population where, where, it is, uh, where it dominates. And it, uh, Belt and Road definitely triggers the Islamic economy. And I will uh, talk about it a little uh, later on. So, but. Yeah, uh, uh, so we are talking predominantly about this, uh, where is that, here, uh, this part of the world, and uh, I want, s yeah, here it's, you can see it better, better here. So we're talking about Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, as well as Turkey and Iran, 10 countries in total. If you, if you think about this territory as a single country, it's pretty, pretty huge and significant. And uh, we, we've collected some, you know, put some data here. But uh, at the same time, we have to understand that this is not a single country. It's pretty diverse in many ways. So um, the question we usually ask, is that, okay, uh, Belt and Rose is probably one of the m biggest ever uh, coordinated investment initiatives that have ever been undertaken by the human being. Uh, and now the, it goes through the most uh, diverse, disintegrated, fragmented <laughs> part of the world. So what is gonna tell you about the risk management and this kind of things? So, um, yeah. Uh, and, uh, okay, uh, it's diverse, uh, and there are a lot of complications within the region, but the region itself is in a hugely complicated, sophisticated context, because a lot of big powers, you know, fighting against each other, not necessarily fighting, but, uh, you know, working <laughs> with each other in many ways, and uh, around this region. So we have Russia that have, has been there forever, China, a newcomer to this part of the world. We have Islamic powers like Iran, Turkey, Saudi, very active. And we have 
Japanese soft spoken, same as in Indonesia, maybe. We have South Korean also, India, US, predominantly in terms of the military cooperation, and Europe, somewhere in between economic and then social and uh, humanitarian aid sort of things. So a lot, a lot of interests are in this uh, region. And uh, the question is, if you are like um, a country like, well, um, pick one, any. And <laughs> so many big powers are around you trying to settle their own interests that they have nothing to do with yourself. Because China says, OK, we, we need to deliver our stuff to Europe. So what's in between? We don't care. <laughs> and when you when you when you when you ask someone here, you say, "Come on, no, 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 no. We need to find some kind of compromise in the way how it's done." Um, so uh, let's. Uh, yeah, this slide is pretty much illustrates the the diversity. They have all the, uh, these countries. They have all the possible uh, uh, political systems from. Uh, um, democracies, young democracies, to authoritarian. They have very different economic models. Some of the countries are very rich uh, in mineral resources. Some of them have very advanced industries, industrial economies. And some of uh, the countries are very pure and poor in resources, and they don't have much uh, industry, so they're predominantly ag agricultural. So very different. And culturally, we have, yes, probably they are all Muslims, but some of them are uh, Sunni, some of them are um, uh, yeah, Sharia, uh, Sh uh, Shia, and um, uh, 100 uh, ethnicities, more than that languages. So how you can possibly do a project that goes across these countries? One more thing. These countries have never existed before the collapse of the, so collapse of the Soviet Union. So most of the borders are artificial. We know the things can go pretty wrong with the artificial borders. And uh, so these countries, they are not only very diverse, they have a lot of disputes among themselves. Territorial, uh, ethnic, uh, resource-based, like water, for example. So when, when you are China and you're trying to just you, you don't want to, 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 you know, you just need to build some, some, some road that goes through the region to some other part of the world. But then you see that you cannot work with one country without making the other country angry. So, <laughs> and that, that, that's pretty much of the case in this uh, uh, region. So, um, one thing to add, but these countries, they understand that it's not going to lead us anywhere and we need to work together. So the countries have started building some relationship between each other in many ways, economic, military, security, uh, ethnical uh, identity, but so many organizations. And they're competing against each other as well. So we have very diverse dynamic and very interesting region here. What about? But, um, We've uh, collected some data about the Belt and Road uh, Initiative projects, and uh, uh, um, probably it's not the largest uh, in terms of the, well, I think it's just the whole region is uh, just twice as big as uh, Pakistan in terms of the um, number of, uh, well, uh, the, in terms of the amount of money coming along the Belt and Road to the region. But if we see, uh, so there are only four countries that make, that make over 70% of all investment. Uh, it's Russia, Kazakhstan, Turkey, and Iran. And uh, most of the money come to energy sector. So you can guess that it's oil and gas, and it's all about Chinese interest in getting these resources to China to fuel its, their growth and their growing needs. And uh, if you add uh, a little bit of industrial infrastructure and uh, um, infrastructure like, like roads and everything, you will get 75% of all investment concentrated in these three sectors. Um, 
in terms of the dynamics, it's also very interesting. Again, um, Russia, Turkey, Iran, Kazakhstan, and others. So you see that these four countries definitely make, the, or, or make or attract the most of the investments along the belt and road. You see the sharp drop in 2016, and it's very different from the other parts of the world where you see the growth uh, in, in 2016 as well. We were trying to explain this uh, drop uh, by the cautiousness of the Chinese investors because after the Belt and Road was announced, they were made some strange investments like, not investments, actually acquisitions, British football club, Hollywood film producer, whatever. And uh, we heard that the presidency said, okay, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, it's not Belt and Road. So let's do Belt and Road things. Infrastructure investment, these kind of things. But uh, in fact, uh, it's not only that, and uh, I should mention that uh, there is a sanctions mode against Russia and uh, something around Iran as well. So I th we believe that it, o it also impacts China, although China does not officially support the sanctions against Russia and Iran. But we believe that in, when it gets to the practical points, the specific companies that work on the ground, they, they definitely take into account that uh, they might not be very well welcome in other parts of the world if they do not comply with the overall consensus about what's good and bad in, uh, in regard to Russia. And, uh, but there are many other reasons, but we expect that it's gonna grow in the next years, but here we have a uh, decline. And uh, one thing to mention, in 2015, uh, 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 Iran deal was like, a nuclear, Iran nuclear deal was kind of signed. And uh, next year we see a huge uh, uh, growth in, in uh, Chinese investment into Iran. And if it was not Iran, it, this, uh, 2016 looked would, would would have looked like complete disaster. Um, yeah, I'll probably uh, skip this uh, just to quickly mention that we were really surprised to see that uh, like 70 percent of all projects initiated along the Belt and Road in this region either have been completed or been implemented. So it's not only the political noise, it's practical activity that is happening, which is uh, pretty surprising for us because, when we, because we hear more about large projects that are going very slow. But uh, when it gets to the numbers, we see that a lot of small, medium-sized projects have been successfully implemented and uh, it tells us that this initiative really makes difference for the region. Um, yeah, and uh, this uh, is also very important perspective um, um, that, is, uh, that tells us about the risk appetite. So uh, uh, China is probably one of the very few possible investors uh, into the region, uh, but if, if you if you see the um, structure of most most of the projects, so the, the the structure of the uh, the funding structure, so you you will see that uh, uh, in many in most of the projects, seventy percent. 70% of projects, China is a principal investor, meaning that it invests more than 75% of funds. It means that without China, it's no, it would have never happened. Uh, this is to illustrate, um, unfortunately, I didn't have time to put uh, the, the belts and roads on this uh, uh, map, but you, can, you, you, you remember them, definitely. So these are the Islamic countries, so everywhere the road goes, it goes through Islamic uh, territories. And, we, and this is another observation which is very important. In many ways, in many, in many uh, cases, 
we see that I Islamic development financial institutions are partners to China in developing these projects in the region. So probably Islamic development funds like uh, Islamic Development Bank or sovereign funds, they are second to China in terms of the size of the investment into infrastructure and overall uh, development. So um, I will probably skip, the, Russia is definitely the biggest uh, country in terms of the Belt and Road and, I, and half of all the money come to energy and I will uh, illustrate it on this project. It's a I think it's a model project for Russia. It's power of Siberia. It's a gas pipeline that goes from like Siberia to uh, uh, China and the eastern, uh, far eastern parts of Russia. Why it is important? Um, uh, and when it happened? Actually, the deal was signed in uh, 2014. And one other important thing happened in 2014. It was Crimea. Um, so Crimea happens, Russia thinks okay. Uh, and uh, well, uh, just to, just one step back, sorry. Russia uh, supplies all its petrochemicals to uh, hydrocarbons, sorry, to Europe by pipelines. There are no pipelines going to, um, e to the east. And uh, there, is, uh, there is only one LNG plant existing in, in, in Russia, which is, uh, not definitely uh, enough. So um, uh, Crimea, European sanctions, uh, this deal signed. So uh, w when I say it's all about alternatives for Russia, it's uh, no matter what the price for the gas price is, no matter how economically efficient it is, it's about uh, uh, getting access to the alternative market. For China, it's also uh, probably too expensive, but uh, it's an alternative to the gas that China gets from um, Middle East in, tent, uh, in LNG form uh, because they depend on fifth, sevenths, and uh, fifths, sixth, and sevenths fleets, so it can be cut uh, instantly. So it's also all about alternatives. And uh, the deal size. Four hundred billion dollars for three for thirty years in gas. The construction is not is not that big. It's uh, only seventy billions, but all, obviously it's one of the biggest projects along the Silk Road. And uh, just to mention, Kazakhstan also seventy five percent in uh, energy. Remarkable uh, that only seventy percent in oil and gas, but. 25 is in renewables, so we see how China helps uh, Kazakhstan to develop its renewable part of energy, which is not only let's just sucking out its oil, but also help to develop um, uh, uh, its um, industry. And in uh, Kazakhstan, there is also an, an interesting project. It's in uh, on the border between China and Kazakhstan. It's um, Dry port, unlike Gwadar was a real port, seaport, but this one is a dry port. And uh, the, the reason for that project was very simple because uh, so Soviet, there was a Soviet rail standard and Chinese uh, rail standard and they don't match. So when, you, when the trains go from China to the former Soviet territories, you need it just to, stop, to make a stop and reload, basically reload stuff. But, um, the Kazakh uh, Kazakhstani leadership wanted to make more of that than, ju than just uh, reloading. They made a, a hub, logistics hub. So now there they, you reload, but also there are roads coming and you can uh, distribute goods in the region from that point. And also they made a special economic zone and also they hired Dubai uh, company uh, to run, to operate this the whole thing. So uh, in, in many ways, uh, f they made, it looks like they've made uh, a lot of benefits from just uh, a logistics obstacle. So you have a, an obstacle that you have to reload stuff, but you can turn it out into an economic opportunity, what they, uh, they did. And um, yeah, so I'll probably leave more for the Q&A. Thank you very much.